Hello everybody, I am Rashid Yasi and I welcome all of you on combined platform of Khan study group and at the same time Eden IS. Now I will be taking some important sections of your general studies and I will be taking whole portion of history along with international relations as well. Now today we will be starting with one of the most important topic of UPSC examination. This topic is Indian national movement that also proved to be the world's longest movement and that also led to the establishment of the world's largest functional democracy till con in contemporary times. Now just understand till middle of 19th century India was just a geographical entity. There was no feeling of nationalism or belonging to one common nation among inhabitants of this country. But by middle of 19th century, after suppression of a mighty revolt known as revolt of 1857, some educated and conscious Indians began to contemplate that what has been the possible reason that led to subjugation of vast country like India by handful of foreigners. And as a result of this contemplation, these persons came to conclusion that lack of nationalism among large inhabitants of India has been primarily responsible for India's subjugation by British authority. Therefore, they decided to start an organized agitation to convert India into a nation and this agitation came to be known as Indian National Movement. First of all, we need to understand the logic or philosophy behind the name of this movement. It is known as national movement because the purpose was to convert the large country of India into a nation whereby people should think beyond their personal interest, beyond their regional interest in order to transform this vast geographical country into a nation. And when this movement was started in second half of 19th century, by end of 19th century, a national body was established to start this agitation in an organized manner. This national body is known as Indian National Congress, which was established by end of 1885. And with formation of this national body, India's struggle started in a small but organized fashion. And in the beginning of 20th century, British authority decided to weaken rising nationalism in India. And with this intention, they decided to partition the most active province of India. This province was eastern province of Bengal, which even included the provinces of Bihar and Orissa as well. And with this decision to divide Bengal in 1905, Indian national movement entered a radical form supported by several leaders in India. The partition of Bengal took effect on 16th of October 1905 and as a result of this partition, several leaders of India joined hands at this time and they decided to launch first mass movement against partition of Bengal which is known as Swadeshi movement. Here today we will talk about Swadeshi movement, what were the major achievements of Swadeshi movement, major characteristics of this movement and why this movement came to an end just after few years in the first decade of 20th century. So today we will start with this first mass movement. This movement known as Swadeshi movement was started, Swadeshi movement was started in 1905 and it went on till 1908. Now just understand first of all that this movement was started in order to oppose partition of the most active province of India. That province was Bengal at this time. And at this time this movement was started by all Congress leaders who were also known as moderates and extremists by this time. Some leaders were known as moderate leaders because they only wanted to promote constitutional agitation confined within four walls of law. But at the same time extremist leaders were those leaders who wanted to promote mass agitation to get some major actions or some major rewards from British authority. Therefore, both moderates and extremists combined together launched this movement known as Swadeshi movement in 1905 when partition took effect exactly on 16th of October. Now, just understand, this movement is known as Swadeshi movement or indigenous movement because the very objective of this movement 
was to generate confidence, self-reliance among people of India so that they can fulfill all the requirements without British support. This was necessary in order to give them sufficient confidence to stand against most progressive rulers all across the world. This movement started in 1905 was therefore based on philosophy which is known as philosophy of Atma Shakti, Atma Shakti or also known as self-reliance. The objective was that if every person develops their own confidence, then no authority would be able to suppress them. And guided by this philosophy of self-reliance, the greatest feature of this movement was witnessed in growth and development of cultural, uh, cultural traits in province of Bengal. Several cultural personalities emerged in province of Bengal. They began to promote indigenous culture of Bengal to arouse the confidence and esteem, self-esteem of people in Bengal. During with beginning of this movement, the great literary figure of Bengal named as Rabindranath Tagore. He advised the people of Bengal to celebrate the festival of Raksha Bandhan in an unique fashion. This festival was celebrated whereby people of East and West Bengal, they decided to tie threads on each other's wrist in order to indicate that partition of Bengal was not acceptable to them. Moreover, the, these two, these persons tied, uh, tied, wrist on, uh, tied threads on each other's wrist also to indicate that British authorities should not try to divide the people of Bengal along religious lines. The reason was that British authority decided to divide the province of Bengal into eastern and western half with declared logic that they wanted to introduce administrative efficiency. But Indian leaders understood the real agenda that British authority wanted to divide the people of Bengal along religious lines as eastern part of Bengal had majority of Muslim population whereas western part of Bengal had numerical majority of Hindu population and therefore in order to ex in order to oppose the such partition along religious lines people decided to celebrate Raksha Bandhan in this unique manner whereby Hindus and Muslims of two parts of Bengal tied threads on each other's wrist to show indestructible unity. At the same time Rabindranath Tagore composed a song at this time. This song is entitled as Amar Sonar Bangla. This song highlighted the rich cultural traditions of Bengal and this song became so much popular that it was later accepted as national anthem of Bangladesh when it was liberated by India in 1971. At the same time, another cultural personality emerged in Bengal at this time named as Bankim Chanchatopadhyay and this person composed a song which is no entitled as Vande Matram and this song which was originally composed in Sanskrit language, this song became the theme song of national movement went on to inspire large number of youths in India and even now this song is considered to be one of the most important and inspiring song for people all across Indian territory. At the same time, apart from this cultural activities towards it in field of composing songs and literary activities, there was one another person who contributed towards artistic activities to promote indigenous culture. This person was Abhanindranath Tagore. He was a leading painter in Bengal and Abhanindranath Tagore discarded European theme in his painting adopted the themes from Mughal and Rajput paintings in order to highlight indigenous culture of Bengal and India during course of this movement. In order to support artistic activities through institutional mechanism during this movement, a very prominent institution was established in 1907. This movement organized, this institution was known as Oriental Society of Art and this institution began to provide scholarships and fellowships to leading artistic personalities. The first recipient of this scholarship was Nandalal Bose. He was a great literary figure and he was given a huge amount of support by this institution. Not only in indigenous culture, to promote indigenous culture, at the same time, pro pro the same time several persons came to forefront to promote indigenous industries in Bengal as well. And one such person was Achar Praful Chandri. This person established Bengal Chemical Factory and this factory started to produce chemical products to reduce dependency of Bengal on imported chemical products from European world. 
all these initiatives taken at this time gave huge amount of confidence to people of Bengal and these, pe these people began to oppose any policy of British to divide them along religious lines in the province of Bengal. But when this movement reached its climax, reached its uh, zenith, this movement got adversely affected by two major developments in India that again indicate that feeling of nationalism has not percolated to, the, to every section of Indian society. These factors were number one. When this Swadeshi movement was started, British authority began to play their communal card in province of Bengal. They began to convince Muslim masses of East Bengal that this partition has been done primarily to safeguard their interest in Bengal because they give logic that in United Bengal, Muslims were in minority. In divided Bengal, Muslims are in majority in eastern part of Bengal. And that is why on this basis, they began to support partition of Bengal. Some Muslim leaders got convinced, of, uh, convinced and at the same time, it led to establishment of a communal organization in Bengal, which is known as all India Muslim League. All India Muslim League was started, established in 1906 and the leaders of this communal body began to ask Muslim masses to keep themselves aloof from Swadeshi movement. Just because of the such declaration, the declaration demand, suspicion and distrust began to get generated among members of both religious communities and it is no surprise that at height of Swadeshi movement, communal rights broke out throughout the province of Bengal. That adversely affected Swadeshi movement and this movement started to wane away because of communal divide in province of Bengal. But there was another major factor that affected the sustenance of this movement for a long period of time. This factor was differences in approach and strategy followed by moderates and extremists. We had discussed right now only Moderates were those leaders who only wanted to follow constitutional methods of agitation like petitions and applications to be presented before British. But extremists were radical leaders who wanted to launch mass movement in India and through mass movement they wanted to gain some major rewards. And rewards. Therefore, when this Swadeshi movement was started, moderates wanted to confine this movement within province of Bengal. But at the same time, extremists wanted to extend this movement beyond province of Bengal to rest of Indian territory. Even the greatest representative of extremist school, Bal Ganga Datulag, had started this movement in different parts of Indian territory. With regard to extent, with regard to pace or with regard to acceleration, differences began to take place between moderate leaders on the one hand, extremist leaders on the other hand. And therefore, these differences reached a high point in 1906 when Swadeshi movement was progressing. And by the end of 1906, both moderates and extremists wanted to elect their own candidate as Congress president to get their strategy accepted. But in order to avoid any major split within Congress rank, moderates and extremists decided to choose a person who was equally respected by all leaders. This person was Dada by Naraji. He presided over annual session of Congress convened at Calcutta in 1906. And during this session, Dada by Naraji not only avoided any split within Congress party, he also took a very important step to promote national movement in India. For the first time from Congress platform, Dada by Naraji demanded Swaraj from British authority. Now we need to understand what was this concept of Swaraj, which was demanded by Dada by Norji, formally from Congress platform in 1906. The word Swaraj meant not independence from British rule. One thing must be understood. The word Swaraj only meant right of self-government or right of autonomy under overall control of British authority. Here we'll discuss two important terms. There are two terms known as autonomy and sovereignty. Autonomy means rights of administering itself within the territory of India and within territory of any country. And sovereignty means the total control over foreign affairs, defense and communication exerted by another authority. Therefore, at this time Indian leaders never demanded sovereignty, that is total control of Indian territory. Rather, they only demanded that they should be given the right to look after the internal affairs. This came to be known by, known by the term home rule or this also came to be known by the term Swaraj or rights of self 
government. This was formally demanded by the, the Dada Bhai Norji at Calcutta session. And this draft of Saraj was prepared by personal secretary of Dada Bhai Norji at Calcutta session. This person was a young barrister named as Muhammad Ali Jinnah and he prepared this draft and from here only he began to be considered as great expert of constitutional affairs. This was done during Calcutta session but as soon as Calcutta session came to an end differences again began to take place among moderates and extremists. The reason was again moderates wanted to confine this movement within Bengal but extremists wanted to extend this movement outside the province of Bengal. When differences began to take place with regard to pace and extent again, the whole atmosphere got disturbed and under disturbed political atmosphere, the next annual session of Congress was convened at Surat in 1907 and this session at Surat was presided by a moderate leader. This moderate leader was Rash Bihari Ghosh. Now just understand one thing, in course of national movement, there were two personalities. One was known as Rash Bihari Ghosh. Another is known as, was known as Rash Bihari Bose. And both are totally opposed to each other. Rash Bihari Ghosh was a moderate leader who believed in constitutional methods. Raj Bihari Bose was a revolutionary who believed in assassinating unpopular British officers in order to create fear in the minds. So revolutionaries were totally different leaders in course of national movement. Raj Bihari Bose was a revolutionary. Raj Bihari Ghosh was a moderate and this person presided over Surat session in 1907. And during this session, Congress leaders announced that extremist leaders cannot remain with this party and extremist leaders walked away from Congress session and that resulted into formal split among Congress party in 1907 which is also known in international movement as Surat split of 1907 and after this Surat split the Swadeshi movement could not be provided effective leadership sustained leadership and this movement uh, this movement gradually went away in beginning of 1908. So the greatest factor that led to the end of Swadeshi movement was lack of sustained leadership apart from communal divide that got created in, in province of Bengal during this mass movement. But when this movement came to an end in the beginning of 1908, British authority adopted a two-pronged strategy during national movement. This two-pronged strategy was, sta was pro started in order to deal with moderates and extremists in a separate fashion. Moderates never proved to be a real threat for British authority. Therefore, British authority decided to follow the policy of conciliation towards moderates. They decided to appease moderate leaders and on the other hand, they decided to follow the policy of brutal suppression against extremist leaders. The reason was extremist leaders proved to be the real threat for them because extremist leaders had been challenging them through mass agitation and they knew moderate leaders could be easily conciliated by giving constitutional reforms in India. And as a mark of brutal suppression against extremist leader, British authority arrested the greatest representative of this school. This person was Bal Ganga Dartalak. He was arrested in 1908 and he was deported to Mandale Jail in Burma where he stayed for six years. And when he stayed there for six years, he returned back in 1914 as a different personality altogether. The reason being, he was continuously tortured and beaten by British authority and therefore there was a natural factor that led to the end of all fire, the end of all aggression in Bal Ganga Dartalak. But on the other hand, as mark of conciliation to be followed again with moderate leaders, British authority constituted an expert committee and this expert committee comprised of India's Secretary of State in London, this person was named as Lord Morley and this committee also included Indian Viceroy. This Indian Viceroy was named as Lord Minto and these two persons that is Lord Morley and Lord Minto drafted a set of proposals 
in order to satisfy moderate leaders in India. And based on these reform proposals, also known as Morlemento reforms, Central Executive Legislative Council in India drafted a new act. This act is known as Indian Council Act of 1909. And this Indian Council Act of 1909 tried to satisfy moderate leaders to a large extent. But even, even these acts could not totally supply, absolutely satisfy the moderate leaders and resentment continued to take place against British authority. British authority also took another step in order to conciliate the moderate leaders and in this, in this process, British authority convened a grand darbar in 1911, royal court in 1911, which was convened at Delhi. And this grand darbar was attended by none other than the monarch of Britain. This monarch of Britain was named as George V. This person attended the grand darbar at Delhi and this person made two important announcements on 12th of December 1911. First of all, this British monarch announced that partition of Bengal is annulled. He announced the end of partition of Bengal to satisfy moderate leaders. But at the same time, he decided to separate linguistic region of Bengal from Hindi and Uriya speaking states of Bihar and Urissa at this time. Therefore, with this declaration, Bengali speaking region got separated from Hindi and Uriya speaking region. And Bengal, when it was separated, the importance of Calcutta automatically, automatically came, to, came to an end. And therefore, it was decided that capital of modern India needs to be transferred from Calcutta to some strategic location. And therefore, in 1911, Delhi was declared to be the capital of modern India. And since then, even now, Delhi remains to be capital of modern India, which was done to conciliate moderate leaders during Grand Darbar in Delhi. At the same time, no major political agitation took place in India since the bifurcation, since the divide of Congress members at Surat in 1907. From the year 1907 till 1914, there were no political agitations in India. In the year 1914, Bal Ganga Dirtlak returned back to India. And at this time when he returned back to India, he decided to activate national movement. And in order to activate national movement, first thing he demanded was extremist leaders should be allowed to enter into Congress party. And fortunately for Tilak, this time this person was supported by an Irish reformer who had been in India since a long time. This Irish reformer was Annie Besant. And Annie Besant decided to support Tilak as she began to take deep interest in course of political agitation in India. Now here, we'll understand something about this lady that is Annie Besant as well. Annie Besant was an Irish lady. He had, she had come to India by end of 19th century in order to promote religious and social reform. And as a mark of social reform, Annie Besant's major contribution was she established a very prominent educational institution at Banaras in 1898 known as Central Hindu School. And this school only became the nucleus for establishment of world-class university in 1916 at Banaras known as Banaras Hindu University. This led to huge popularity of Annie Besant. And with support of Andy Besson, Tilak began to demand reintegration of moderates and extremists. But finally, this integration took place in 1916 when annual session of Congress was convened at Lucknow. This is considered to be a historic session in course of Indian national movement as major decisions were taken during Lucknow session in 1916. Just understand first of all, Lucknow session was presided by a great leader of national movement, Ambika Charan Majumdar. And during this session, both Tilak and Anni Besan first of all requested the integration of two wings of Congress. And this demand was finally accepted and extremists got reunited with Congress party during Lucknow session. But at the same time, much more important than this, another decision took place. At this time, Bal Ganga the Tilak and another leader, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, demanded integration or merger of All India Muslim League 
with Congress party. This demand was also accepted and All India Muslim League got merged with Congress party in 1916. By, just, by this system only, Tilak began, Muhammad Ali Jinnah began to be regarded as a great secular leader. In fact, he was given the title of Ambassador of Hindu-Muslim Unity by Sarojini Naidu, another great prominent leader. And during this session, a pact was signed among Congress members and leaders of Muslim League, which is also known as Lucknow Pact. And this Lucknow Pact led to merger of All India Muslim League with Indian National Congress. At the same time, the, a very controversial decision was taken by Congress members. Since All India Muslim League, which was considered to be a representative party of Muslim masses, since this party had been merged with Indian National Congress, in order to avoid any suspicion in minds of Muslim masses, British authority, or Congress members declared, de declared that separate electorates would be guaranteed for Muslim masses in India. Now, what was this separate electorates? We need to understand this concept. Separate electorates was a provision which was introduced by British authority for Muslims in Indian Council Act of 1909. According to principle of separate electorates, certain electoral constituencies were to be demarcated and from those constituencies only Muslim candidates could contest election. Not only this, from those demarcated constituencies only Muslim masses were allowed to cast their vote. So even the right of franchise was restricted to Muslim masses. All mechanism was divide, decided in order to elect Muslim candidates from those demarcated constituencies. But the real agenda of British authority was to give a message to masses in India that political interests of Muslim masses are totally distinct and therefore that can be decided only by Muslim masses in India. It was a well calculated strategy to divide Indian people again on religious lines in order to weaken rising nationalism. But Congress party during Lucknow session formally accepted the principle of separate electorates that indicated that even Congress members accepted that Muslim interest was totally distinct in India from other communities and they need to be given a special safeguard in India. This controversial decision was taken at Lucknow session and it is also regarded by scholars it became one of the most important factor for partition of India by big middle of 20th century. But at the same time, during Lucknow session, Bal Ganga Dattla gave two other proposals to bring about restructuring of Congress party. Bal Ganga Dattla personally proposed that since Congress party has become a large party, within this party, a compact body should be formed to sustain mass agitation in India. This compact body was termed by Bal Ganga Dattla as Congress Working Committee. Congress Working Committee was to be formed so that this Congress Working Committee could meet regularly in order to sustain any mass agitation, which could not be done by Congress Party as it is meant to be a large party that could convene meeting only in form of annual session. Even though it was a practical support proposal given by Tilak, it could not be accepted by Congress Party. That again indicated personally Tilak had not emerged to be a popular leader. Both the demands of Tilak had earlier been accepted only with support of Annie Besant and Muhammad Ali Jinnah. At the same time, Tilak also proposed another thing. He made it clear that since Congress Party is confined only among educated classes of India, in order to enhance accessibility of Congress Party, Provincial Congress Committee should be formed and this Provincial Congress Committee should be established in every province of India based on local languages, based on linguistic criteria so that common masses could also attach with Provincial Congress Committees and in turn can, in turn can get attached with National Movement of India. It was also a practical proposal given by Talak, but it could also not be accepted during Lucknow session. We will see later on. Exactly after four years, both these proposals were given by Mahatma Gandhi in 1920 and when this, these were given by Mahatma Gandhi, they were accepted unanimously by Congress members. The reason was not Mahatma Gandhi, the reason was again Bal Ganga Dattla because on 1st of August 1920, Bal Ganga Dattla passed away and since people were filled with desire to fulfill the dreams of this patriotic son, respecting the sentiments of Tilak, Mahatma Gandhi presented both these demands before Nagpur session 1920 when it was unanimously accepted by 
all Congress leaders. But with all major decisions, Lucknow session proved it to be highly effective that came to an end in 1916. But at the same time, in 1916, both Tilak and Annie Besson also decided to activate national movement by launching a unique mass movement in India. So, movement in India, this movement is known as Home Rule Movement in India. Now, we will understand about this movement, the logic behind this movement. Since Annie Besson was an Irish lady, she had come from Ireland, which was also under the sovereign control of Britain. But in Ireland, people had demanded home rule, rights of self-government, or in Indian context known as Swaraj. And this home rule movement in Ireland had proved to be highly successful. And British authority had granted the rights of self-government to people of Ireland. Since this movement became highly successful in Ireland, Annie Besson wanted to launch this movement in India also, as she realized the demand of Indian leaders were also to establish home rule or rights of self-government under overall control of British authority. She gave this idea to Bal Ganga the Tilak. And after this idea was accepted by Tilak, both leaders launched another mass movement in 1916 known as Home Rule Movement. Tilak started his Home Rule Movement in April 1916 in regions like Maharashtra, Karnataka, Central Provinces and Berar. And on the other hand, Annie Besson started the Home Rule Movement in September 1916. Now, what was the logic of this movement? The major logic, and, uh, logic of this movement was to give message to masses in India that they should understand the meaning of home rule. They should understand the meaning and significance of Swaraj so that they can be united to fight, stand against British rule. And therefore, both Tilak and Andy Besson adopted a very practical and mass-centric approach in order to create such awareness among masses in India. During course of this movement, both Tilak and Andy Besson decided they will not focus on urban areas. They will rather focus on remotest villages of India. The reason was, in urban areas, there was relatively awareness, or people were relatively aware about home rule or Swaraj. But masses in rural areas were not at all aware with this concept. So, for both Itilak and Nini Besan, went from villages to villages on foot. They give long speeches whereby they explain the concept of Swaraj or home rule to masses in India. Not only this, both Tilak and Andy Basin, they distributed handwritten papers and pamphlets among masses whereby they explained the meaning and significance of home rule. More, at the same time, both these leaders also established reading rooms and libraries in remotest villages of India whereby materials concerned with home rule were kept so that even if some people are educated at village level, they can read and in turn explain the meaning of home rule to remaining masses in India. In this way, very practical and very down-to-earth approach was followed by both Tilak and Annie Besant at this time. And when they began to follow both the, uh, such approach, national movement for the first time turned the, uh, to touch the common masses in this country and ground began to be prepared for the launch of another mass movement in India. So the seeds for real mass movement was led during home rule agitation of Tilak and Annie Besan. But like Swadeshi movement, this movement also could not be sustained just because of lack of sustained leadership. The reason was that when this movement started to emerge highly popular among masses in India, even it created insecurity among British authority. And out of anxiety, British authority arrested Annie Besant in the beginning of 1917. And when Andy Besson was arrested, large number of Congress leaders also joined Home Rule Movement and they collectively demanded that Andy Besson should be immediately released. And under combined pressure of Indian leaders, Andy Besson was released in 1917. And on request of leaders like Tilak, Andy Besson was made Congress President in 1917. And in this way, Annie Besant became first women president of Indian National Congress and this association was convened at Calcutta in 1917. It was a great development in the course of Indian national movement. At the same time, in order to check the growth and check the growth of home rule agitation in India, British authority took a radical step. And at this time, there was Secretary of State for India named as Lord Montego. And this Secretary of State for India, Lord Montego, made a very important declaration in British Parliament. Lord Montego made a declaration in August 1917, 
which is popularly known as August Declaration. And under this declaration, he assured some major rights of self-government to people of India. Now, just understand August Declaration. In this declaration, which was given in August 1917, in this declaration, Lord Montagu made it clear that ultimate aim of British rule in India is to associate more and more Indians in system of administration to establish responsible government. I'll repeat, under August declaration, Secretary of State declared that ultimate aim of British rule in India is to associate more and more Indians in system of administration to establish a responsible government. In other words, he accepted the demand of home rule. He accepted the demand of self-government, even though he never used the word self-government or Swaraj in his declaration. But as soon as he gave this declaration, Annie Besant realized the aim of her home rule movement has been achieved. And therefore, she decided to end her home rule movement. Even Tilak alone was not enthusiastic to sustain this movement. And moreover, Tilak decided to go to London at this time. The reason was he wanted to file a case against a British journalist in London. This journalist in London was named as Valentine Chirol. And this person, Valentine Chirol, has declared Tilak to be father of Indian unrest. Father of Indian unrest means a person responsible for all major problems in India. Therefore, Tilak decided to file a defamation case against Valentine Chirol. And with this intention, he went to London. Since he was away from, from India for several critical months, this movement, that is Home Rule Movement, gradually waned away in the beginning of 1918. Therefore, this movement that was also a mass movement continued from 1916 to 1918. And when this movement came to an end, at this point of time, large scale consciousness had been created among people, which was the greatest achievement of home rule agitation. Therefore, we have seen till this time that both or almost all mass movements came to an end because of one primary factor. That factor was lack of sustained leadership. But at the same time, by this time, a person came back to India who started a long sustained agitation against British rule. And he was able to give organized and sustained leadership to mass movement that ultimately resulted into India's independence. This person was Mahatma Gandhi, a great soul. This person came to India on 9th of January 1915 when he was already 46 years old. And by this time, he had developed huge reservoir of experience far away from his motherland that is in South Africa. And with huge reservoir of experience, he returned back to India in, on 9th of January 1915 and he started, decided to launch mass movement in India, but on advice of his political mentor, Gopal Krishna Gokhale. First of all, he moved across Indian territory, he understood Indian scenario, and finally in the year 1920, he gave a call for nationwide agitation in India, and this nationwide agitation marked the beginning of first mass movement under leadership of Mahatma Gandhi. This movement is popularly known as non-cooperation movement. This movement continued again for two years only, but this movement was marked by certain distinctive features. But before we discuss such kind of movements under the leadership of Mahatma Gandhi, we need to understand the philosophy, the strategy, the form of struggle and the techniques of this great leader who is regarded as greatest personality of 20th century, not only in India, one of the, but one of the greatest leader all across the world as well. First of all, we need to understand the philosophy, we need to understand the form, the techniques and strategy of mass struggle that was started by Mahatma Gandhi, but that was learned by Mahatma Gandhi far away in South Africa only. We need to understand this leader. Because off and on you get questions, what would have been the shape of Indian national movement if Mahatma Gandhi was not there on scene. But Mahatma Gandhi, when he came to scene, he completely transformed national movement to a large extent and he was able to lead a sustained agitation till the middle of 20th century when India emerged to be an independent nation. Clear. This was a this was a brief outlook or this was a brief outline 
of Indian national movement from the beginning of 20th century till the second end of second decade of 20th century when Mahatma Gandhi gave a call for a nationwide agitation in India. Now, first of all, just understand about the Mahatma Gandhi also. We need to understand this personality because this personality is very important for examination. You get questions about this personality in essay also. You can get a full fledged essay also. You can get questions on Mahatma Gandhi in general studies as well, in modern history as well. Now, just understand first of all, Mahatma Gandhi, the word Mahatma means soul and this title to give, was given to this person by Rabindranath Tagore. This person was originally named as Mohan Das Karamchand Gandhi and this person was born on 2nd of October 1869 at a place called Porbandar in Gujarat. He was born in a reputed family and since he was born in a reputed family, he acquired all his formal education from leading institution and finally he became a lawyer at young age of 24 years. And as a lawyer, he got first major legal assignment to fight a case for a Gujarati merchant. This merchant was named as Dada Abdullah. But this case was to be fought not in India, was to be fought far away in South Africa. Therefore, at young age of 24 years, Mahatma Gandhi decided to go to South Africa on a one-year contract. He landed up in city of Durban in 1893. But when he landed up in city of Durban, he realized large number of Indians were subjected to racial discrimination by people or authorities of South Africa. Therefore, himself became, in, in fact, himself became a victim of racial discrimination and therefore he decided to fight for racial equality in South Africa. And as a mark of, or as, as his struggle started, he developed his own form of struggle, he developed his own technique of struggle, he developed his own strategy of mass struggle. But first of all, the major requirement of a person to become mass leader is the person must be a great fundraiser. This is a practical aspect. Mahatma Gandhi proved himself to be a great fundraiser as well. He demanded funds from his close associates and friends in order to launch mass movement in South Africa. And several persons came to assist, this, assist Mahatma Gandhi and with such assistance, Mahatma Gandhi established an, a spiritual center in South Africa. This spiritual center established in South Africa came to be known as Tolstoy Farm. It was named as Tolstoy Farm because Mahatma Gandhi himself was very much influenced by Russian writer Leo Tolstoy. And based on his name, he named this center as Tolstoy Farm. And when he started the struggle against racial discrimination, Mahatma Gandhi developed his own form of struggle. And this form of struggle is known as non-cooperation. Now the logic is Mahatma Gandhi asked his members not to cooperate with exploitative institution and system in order to hold the system, in order to make the system dysfunctional to get demands accepted. Since masses were asked not to cooperate with exploitative system and institution, this form of struggle came to be known as non-cooperation. This was started by Mahatma Gandhi in South Africa. Proceeding further, he also decided, he also declared that if demands of masses are not accepted, the discriminatory laws and rules also needs to be disobeyed. Since he went forward to ask masses not to obey discriminatory laws and rules, this movement came to be known or this form of struggle came to be known as civil disobedience. And as per this agitation or as per this form of struggle, he asked masses not to obey the rules and regulations of exploitative authority. These were two forms of struggle developed by Mahatma Gandhi, evolved by Mahatma Gandhi through his personal experience known as non-cooperation and civil disobedience. At the same time, Mahatma Gandhi in his course of struggle against racial discrimination also developed his own technique of struggle. This technique of struggle developed by Mahatma Gandhi is known as Satyagraha. And this technique of Satyagraha was based on two principles. These two principles are truth and non-violence. Mahatma Gandhi totally followed these principles of truth and non-violence. That is absolutely one thing must be understood about Mahatma Gandhi, which makes him distinct from all national leaders of India. Mahatma Gandhi made it clear, even routine objectives in the lives must be achieved only by or will be achieved only by principles of truth and non-violence. 
he was ready to compromise with his objective he was ready to compromise with his end but he was never ready to compromise with his means and means were guided by truth and non violence meaning thereby for mahatma gandhi end was not important much more important than end for mahatma gandhi means were important means guided by truth and non violence just because of his consistent belief and faith in principles of satyagraha mahatma gandhi began to be regarded as great personality not only in india but all across the world this was another this was technique evolved by mahatma gandhi known as satyagraha in his struggle against racial discrimination mahatma gandhi evolved his own strategy of mass struggle and this strategy was based on very practical consideration just understand when mahatma gandhi launched mass struggle against racial discrimination masses were asked not to cooperate masses were asked not to disobey meaning that by masses were supposed to leave their economic activities and other activities and to contribute towards mass agitation but since masses were supposed to sacrifice their economic activities and to participate in mass agitation masses could not go on sacrificing endlessly mahatma gandhi realized beyond the point masses cannot sacrifice because mass agitation required huge amount of sacrifices realizing this human limitation mahatma gandhi made clear after every phase of active mass struggle there must be a period of peace there must be a period of truce so that masses should be allowed the time and space to regain back their energy and resources therefore after every phase of active mass struggle mahatma gandhi decided to start a period of truce or peace and mahatma gandhi was of opinion after certain point of peace or truce he may start another phase of active mass struggle in order to move closer towards ultimate objective being a pragmatic person he never wanted to achieve anything in one single go therefore after every active phase of mass struggle period of peace or truce was to followed and after certain period of truce another phase of struggle was to follow this long term strategy followed by mahatma gandhi in south africa this long term strategy came to be known as struggle truce struggle or also known as sts strategy mahatma gandhi evolved his own technique of mass struggle which is known as struggle truce struggle strategy he therefore in short he developed his own form of struggle known as non cooperation or civil disobedience he developed his own technique of struggle known as satyagraha based on truth and non violence he evolved his own strategy of mass struggle known as struggle truce struggle or sts with such huge reservoir of experience mahatma gandhi was invited by gopal krish gokhale who was his political mentor mahatma gandhi reached india in the beginning of 1915 and before launching any mass movement he began to move across indian territory in order to have first hand experience about indian condition and in this process he solved three local issues in india these local issues were concerned with agrarian crisis in region of champaran in north bihar second was industrial dispute concerned with region of ahmedabad in gujarat and third was again an agrarian crisis in region of kheda in gujarat by resolving these local issues mahatma gandhi was able to display his technique was the most able to demonstrate his technique which were readily accepted by masses and therefore he became a true mass leader by resolving these local issues and by the year 1919 enough grounds were prepared for mahatma gandhi to launch first mass movement in india and this mass movement was launched in form of non cooperation movement in india this movement was named as non cooperation because he had developed such form of struggle way back in south africa only but why he launched this non cooperation movement what were the prominent reasons we need to understand those reasons also that led to the beginning of this mass movement in india major reasons for this mass movement was because of developments that took place due to one global crisis in second decade of 20th century this global crisis was in form of first world war first world war broke out in the year 1914 and it went till the year 1918 that gave two important or that generated two important crises in india one was in form of khilafat agitation in india and another was in form of jallianwala bag massacre 
at Amritsar in 1919. Now, what were the backgrounds of this crisis? We will be discussing this entire crisis also because First World War started initially as European conflict, but in course of time it crossed the arena of European conflict and took the form of global conflict by including countries from other continents as well. This war started in 1914 and in this war one country also participated that country was Turkey. And Turkey was a highly important and sensitive country because the ruler of Turkey was regarded by Islamic people all across the world as their spiritual head. And this person was termed as Khalifa or this person was termed as a spiritual head. Therefore, as soon as this war broke out, Islamic people all across the world demanded proper treatment should be given to Khalifa as he was the spiritual head. But as soon as First World War came to an end, a very humiliating treaty was imposed by victorious powers like Britain and France on Turkey whereby major areas were taken away from Turkey. This affected the sentiments of Muslim people all across the world and in India two Muslim brothers in, named as Muhammad Ali and Shaukat Ali. These two Muslim brothers they decided to launch a movement in support of Khalifa of Turkey and this movement therefore kept, came to be known as Khilafat movement. This movement was started in the year 1920 by Muhammad Ali Shaukat Ali in support of Khalifa against British authority. And in the year 1919, another development took place in India. The development was that as per provisions of a reactionary act drafted by British authority known as Rowlett Act, British authority arrested two prominent leaders of Punjab. These leaders were Saif Uddin Kishliu and Dr. Satpal. And when these two popular leaders were arrested by British authority, large number of people protested against this arrest. And therefore, in order to show their protest, large number of unarmed crowd gathered at a place called Jaliawala Bagh. This place is located, located Jaliawala Bagh, this place is located at Amritsar in Punjab. And when large number of people gathered at Jaliawala Bagh, at this time, British military officer named as General Dyer, he entered into premises of Jaliawala Bagh and ordered his troops to fire on unarmed crowd. And in this firing, large number of people died. That is, more than 1,500 people died, including large number of women and children. Not only this, after this massacre, martial law was imposed in Punjab. That affected civil liberty of the people and people were filled with anger all across India. So by the year 1919, because of Khilafat issue and also because of Jaliawala Bagh massacre, massacre, huge resentment prevailed among the people of India and they wanted to launch a mass movement against British authority. And the person who responded to this call of Mahatma or this call of masses was Mahatma Gandhi. And by this time, since he had emerged to be a mass leader, Mahatma Gandhi decided to launch mass movement and this movement was launched in 1920 in form of non-cooperation movement. And this movement was launched with three major objectives by Mahatma Gandhi. First, it was launched to, for redressal of Khilafat wrong. Second, it was launched for redressal of Jaliawala Bagh massacre. And third, was, third, third, was, third objective was to establish Swaraj in India. One thing must be understood. The word Swaraj according to Mahatma Gandhi also meant right of self-government for masses in India, not complete independence. In fact, Mahatma Gandhi at this time never supported complete independence. He only wanted the same kind of autonomy as was demanded by Dada by Norji during Calcutta session of 1906. Therefore, with, with three, three objectives, he launched his first mass movement known as non-cooperation movement in India. And this movement that continued for two years achieved huge amount of success among masses in India. This was arrival of Mahatma Gandhi as a true mass leader and under his guidance Indian national movement started to take a sustained form and just because of this organized and sustained education, India became an independent nation by middle of 20th century. Clear. We will continue with the role of Mahatma Gandhi in the entire course of national movement in our next lecture. Clear. Thank you.